Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Welcome everybody to the Purpose Collective. Great to see uh, everybody joining. So we'll have people joining as we go. Um, so uh, we've got a great session lined up today with Pablo. Um, we've got a lot of familiar faces, some new faces. Uh, so what we do at the beginning of the Purpose Collective is we ask people to introduce themselves in the chat. Uh, say who you are, say where you are in the world. And today I'm not at home. I'm actually in Liverpool, which is the city of my birth. Um, so tell us where you are in the world. And the question today as part of the intro is tell us somebody you trust. Um, so if you, you don't need to name them, you could just put initials, um, but also think of somebody that you trust and also share what is your relationship with that person. And I think that's going to get uh, picked up uh, in the session. So we've got uh, the, the, the Purpose Collective are scattered to the four winds today. So Alberto is in the airport, I think in Schiphol. Is it Schiphol Airport, Alberto, in Amsterdam? It looks like yes, Sarah. Yes. It is. Uh, uh, so. yeah, I'm here uh, with all this, uh, all this, my friends. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, almost ready, ready to fly after the session. But I, could, I couldn't miss this one. So uh, very uh, excited about it. So Alberto is the Jet Set member of the Purpose Collective. Uh, he's always in an exotic location. Um, so, so let's get into the chat. Like I said, if you're just joining us, tell us who you are, tell us where you are in the world. And the question, the starter for 10 question today is let us know somebody you trust and what your relationship is to them. And you don't need to name them. Uh, you could just put their initials. Uh, you could give them a pseudonym. Uh, or even an alter ego, uh, but let's see who we've got. So we've got Mark joining us from near Chester right now, and he trusts RN, who's a church leader. Uh, we've got Joe in Bury St Edmunds, who trusts her mom. Moms are very trustworthy. We've got Esther in London, uh, who supports her, uh, who trusts her life partner. We've got Deborah in the Hague. Welcome back, uh, Deborah, who trusts herself, and her inner voice uh, has been very trustworthy for many years. We've got Catherine. Uh, in Birmingham, uh, and so many answers coming in, I'm having to scroll back up. Uh, I trust my partner from work context in particular, I, I trust my colleague EA. Uh, so work colleague, we've got Pablo, who trusts me. Thank you, Pablo. I hope I don't misplace that trust. Uh, we've got Andy in Stafford, who trusts an old boss of his, who always, always is authentic self. We've got Emily in Cambridge, who trusts her dad. We've got Rawia in The Hague, who trusts her partner and herself. We've got Stuart in Virginia. Welcome, Stuart. Great to have you with us again, uh, who trusts his life partner completely. We've got Nancy in Virginia uh, and trusts herself and SW, who's my life partner. We've got Ian in Sutton Coalfield. So we've got, we've got a, a West Midlands in the UK uh, vibe going on. We've also got a Virginia on the East Coast of the uh, US going on. Uh, someone I trust is a rarity for politics, a Rory Stewart, someone who's authentic and honest about his shortcomings. Uh, so Alberto says, I trust Sarah and me and Pablo and you all. Thank you, Alberto. Uh, we've got Gavin joining from Dublin, uh, trust his wife, we've got Peter uh, in wet central London um, and who uh, shared this morning with his EA how he trusts her 100%. So thank you, everybody. And welcome. If you've just joined us and you haven't had a chance to introduce yourselves in the chat, tell us who you are, tell us where you are in the world and tell us somebody you trust and your relationship to them. And with that, we're going to get on with the session. Uh, I'm Chris Blackwell. I'm one of the co-founders of the Purpose Collective, and I'm going to hand over to my jet-setting colleague, Alberto, uh, who's going to introduce himself. <laughs> now, so this is me, uh, and um, yeah, I'm also a co-founder of the Purpose Collective. Uh, you, I think most of you know us already, and uh, I'm very excited to, to uh, to join this session, uh, Paolo was our guest once already in a live session in London, and uh, I still remember uh, a lot of what you said, Pablo. So looking forward to that, and I'm going to pass uh, over to Sarah. Thank you, Alberto. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I'm going with the West Midlands uh, contingency. That's where I am today. That's home for me in Shrewsbury, in Shropshire. Uh, great to see some familiar faces here. Um, if you're new here for the first time, can you just give me a wave? Are there any folks here for the new? Okay, I can see. So Ian, Paul, um, 
welcome if you're here and Emily here for the first time in particular great to have you with us um, along with Alberto and Chris I'm one of the founders of the Purpose Collective and it's a great pleasure to be introducing Pablo um, Pablo is a true purpose-led leader who um, over the last couple of dec decades has founded or co-founded four purpose-driven businesses, including Learn Direct. He's been awarded an OBE for his services to the development um, of young people and their skills. So Pablo, we're delighted to have you here. Thank you so much for coming back for a second time. Um, I've got a couple of questions for you, Pablo, and then I'm gonna hand fully across to you. Sure. The first question, is who is a purpose superhero for you? And it could be somebody in the public square, somebody in your family. And just while you're gathering your thoughts, Pablo, I'm just gonna share briefly that yesterday I named you as my purpose superhero. <laughs> um, I was at Saeed Business School in Oxford working with a whole group of um, FE leaders on a programme preparing uh, for CEO and um, it was great to have your presence in the room with us. So Pablo, how about for you, a purpose superhero from you? Oh wow Sarah, so that's uh, that's such a hard question. I have so many, so many to choose from. Um, it, it's kind of interesting because I've, I've just been going around interviewing some um, uh, or started interviewing CEOs for, for a book I'm writing and um, so just because it's it's top of my mind, two of the people I've I've had that discussion with, um, and the reason I'm interviewing is that they are heroes of mine. One, one is a, a, a guy called Hayden Taylor. You might even be joining today who runs Unlock. He started a business, purpose-led business, when he was about 16 and has never worked for anybody else. It's now 10 years later and it's going strong, running it with um, uh, his, uh, his co-founder with Ben. Um, an extraordinary individual um, and, and truly inspirational. And the other one is um, uh, somebody called Sally Dicketts, Dame Sally Dicketts, as she is now, who um, ran the City of Oxford College Group, uh, now Activate Learning, for 15 years um, and is now, um, and I see, I see Peter's on the call here, so he, she's, she's managed to rope in Peter to come and, and join her on the board that she now chairs. Um, but look, I mean, there are so many people to choose from, you know, my my life partner, my daughters, my, you know, goodness. Um, so um, it's yeah, I just feel very lucky that that there are there are so many people that happen to be around me. And also I've chosen to be around, which are um, ju just, uh, you know, raise my spirits about um, making the world a better place. Yeah. Oh, thank you. And thank you for naming two people in particular. Great to hear about Hayden and Dame uh, Sally as well. Yeah. Um, and one more question, which is um, when you were younger, so, you know, a little kid or a teenager and you were asked that question around what do you want to be? <laughs> what, what was your answer or what were your answers? Oh no, I was really clear. So when I so uh, this would have been so from about the age of eight up until the age of nineteen, uh, when something else happened. I all I wanted to be was a maths professor. That was it, maths professor. Wow. At the age of at the age of nineteen, I found out that I wasn't good enough. But uh, that's a whole other story. <laughs> oh, and is there any connection at all between what you do now and that desire to be a maths professor? Uh, kind I, of. I've invented a connection. So okay. I'll tell you what it is, which is uh, it's all about pattern recognition. So I worked out that that what, what drew me to maths wasn't so much the numbers and the logic, it was the patterns and seeing the patterns and making sense of patterns. Um, and I've always carried that since. So that's, that's something that I enjoy doing and on a good day, I'm good at doing. And it's, and it's much broader now. It's patterns of people, patterns of emotions, patterns of business, strategic patterns, you name it. Um, so I, I, I'm, I think, I think I'm a, I'm a pattern spotter. There you go. 
Yeah, that does I've, make. I've just invented that word. I'm a pattern spotter. Pattern spotter, and I would imagine yeah. that you're doing that in your interviewing and in your writing. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Will be super to read your book when it hits the shelf. So all the very best uh, with your writing, and I'm going to hand over to you, Pablo. So the floor is yours, and thank you once again. Good, thank you. So just give me a moment while I share my screen, and uh, see if this works. So thumbs up. Can you see that? Lovely. Um, well, welcome everyone. Um, and, uh, and thank you very much for joining today. And thank you particularly to, to Sarah, to Alberto and to Chris for uh, taking the risk of inviting me back again. Um, the, the reason I put Chris in, in, the, in that question of, of who do you trust, he's not the only person I trust, sorry, Chris, it's, it's, it's not just you, um, is um, it was because something happened a few weeks ago when he said to me, would you come and speak? And the fact he asked me that thought, oh, I thought, well, he he obviously has some trust in me. And it took me no time at all to say yes, um, because I trust him. And I thought this is going to be an interesting event. It's I know the Purpose Collective. I know the quality of debate and the motivation that we all have to, to uh, speak together. Um, and then he asked me what I was going to talk about. So we did, I didn't said what it was about. I just said yes. And, you know, um, and I thought for a minute and I thought I'm writing this book and it's probably going to be called Trust. So I thought I better let me try that. Let me. So this is a bit of an outing for me today on a little kind of corner of, of the book I'm doing. Um, and I said it's going to be about trust. I didn't tell him anything else. And he immediately said yes again. That's fine. We'll do that. Um, and, and it's kind of interesting because clearly there's that, that deep trust between Chris and Sarah and Alberto, who have, I guess have gone along with this. And it was only um, last Sunday that I actually, uh, the, so as in two days ago, I actually put together <laughs> what I'm going to talk about, because it's all very current, very much in my mind, and it's it was a problem of what to leave out. But that was that really struck me that that was a really great example of the way when you have that that trusting relationship to be able to work very quickly and to create something and to bring something to life in short order. So I really, really appreciate that. Um, but it also made me think if he rang me up tomorrow and said, hopefully, oh, you know, thanks for that sort of chat yesterday. That was great. By the way, um, you know, I'm I'm going out with my dearly beloved on Friday night and we're a bit stuck for a babysitter. We've been let down. Would you mind driving up uh, for a couple of hours to my house and, and babysit the kids? Because, you know, we're, we're, um, you know, it just help us out, you know, make sure they're settled down, you know, we'll make sure they're fed, you have to do all that, but, you know, and just take care of them when we should be back before midnight. So, you know, would you do that? Um, a, uh, I would be very surprised if he asked me to do that. Um, and uh, B, I would be even more surprised if I said yes. Um, and it's, it's kind of interesting because it made me think about this question of who do you trust? And I'd encourage you to think about those names that you put there, because when there is trust, it's usually to do with um, something quite specific or a set of things, and particularly in a work context, you know, with friendships and family, it's often broader. But even then, you know, I mean, I, I, I trust, you know, my daughters implicitly. They're wonderful people. One of them is a doctor. I wouldn't trust her to do my job, and I definitely wouldn't trust me to do her job. There are conditions, there are limits, there are boundaries. And that's a really important part of what I'm discovering as I go into this territory of trust in the workplace, in my case, um, because the, the, the sense of unconditional trust is not really what we're talking about. We're talking about trust to do X, to do something specific. So I'm going to just um, take us on. So that's that was kind of a, a sort of something I've tripped. It may seem obvious saying it, but almost always, sometimes in the case of perhaps a faith or something like that, it might be different, but almost always trust is conditional. And understanding those conditions and boundaries is a critical part of leadership. But also it's incredibly important. It's what our whole society is based on. If you, if you pull out a 10 pound note, um, I don't know if anybody's actually still got any of those 
things lying around. I actually used a, 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 a note yesterday um, for, for a transaction, very unusual, so I still had one. But I looked at it, and on, on the £10 note, it's not actually money, because the note says, I promise to pay the bearer £10. So that says, this isn't £10, this is a promise to pay you £10. In fact, I'm not sure money really exists anywhere. It's, a, it's just a set of promises, something that we invented around about 4,000 years ago when we discovered how to, how to trade and how to learn to use specialisms and how to build a society which is partly based on trade. And things like the law is the same thing. And when we test the boundaries of the law, we discover that actually that can change as well. And when we have moral enlightenment where we, we move things and we change laws or sometimes uh, moral retrenchment in other directions where we, we change them back again. So everything we do fundamentally as a society is based on trust. So, and business is no different. Now, I'm just going to um, show you a little bit of reading because I'm going to talk about just a, a very, very small part of this whole area. But I wanted to flag up some, um, well, three books, and I'll come to the fourth in a moment, that um, have been very influential most recently when I'm reading. One is, of course, our very own Sarah, her book on Powered by Purpose. So I hope you've all got that and I hope you've all read it. Um, and, and there are some fabulous insights. It's about purpose, but there is, there's some very important insights there about trust within that. Alex Edmonds, who came to talk, I know, to a previous session that we had here um, about growth and business and about how purpose is a positive driver of that. But again, if you look inside the book, trust is in the middle of that. And there are other books as well. One by Anthony Selden, which was very much about the political system in the just in the aftermath of the the Tony Blair Premiership, really interesting book. I recommend that about public institutions. And another one recommended by, again, one of our Purpose Collective colleagues, Valerie Hopkins, recommended to me on Friday, actually, when I saw her, Francis Fukuyama. I hadn't heard about this. Um, and it's about, it's more than 20 years old, but it's about the fundamentals of trust in socioeconomics and how different cultures and countries have got different levels of trust, as I was saying earlier, about how they operate together. So I'm not going to go into all of those things. This is a huge subject, but it's just, I wanted to flag some interesting reading, which I'd recommend if this is a subject you're interested by. So moving on, you may have seen in the rubric for today, um, a quote from Gallup, this is where it comes from, strengths-based leadership, and a piece of research they did a number of years ago, uh, mainly in North America with 10,000 businesses. And what's interesting, they, look, they looked at leadership through the lens of followers. So instead of saying, this is what successful leaders do, they were saying, never mind about the leaders, what do followers need? And it came up with a really, for me, a really interesting list and a very focused list of hope, stability, compassion and trust. And when I read about this a few years ago, it was very influential in how I work with other people and how I work with organisations. And hope, stability and compassion were ones that... I could figure out what they were. I knew what they meant. Uh, I knew what challenge I had to bring on myself as a leader and onto colleagues around me in leading teams and organizations. But trust was always a bit more challenging. It was, it was quite, a, I found it quite a slippery concept. Um, and I'll explain why as I talk, talk through. And in, uh, once I've covered these areas, I'm gonna invite you all to join breakout groups and start to think about a trust and how you've experienced it in organizations you've worked in. And if you look at the definition of trust in the dictionary, um, it talks about reliability. It talks about when you expect something to happen, it happens. And that doesn't quite cut it for me, that dictionary definition. It's quite narrow, it's quite limited. I think trust is a much more visceral and emotional um, process. And the definition I found most useful, this one by Charles Feltman, which is trust is choosing to risk something you value vulnerable to another person's actions. So trust talks about there is a sense of jeopardy involved, sense of risk. And that's a really important part of this. The quote by Peter Drucker, 
which was a very simple insight on leadership. It's about two things, getting things done and trust. So it really elevates trust to a very high level in that definition of leadership. Simon Sinek, who um, I'm sure you all know, talks a lot about this subject. But in particular, he talks about trust beating rationality, those hard won logical data based arguments. They always lose out when there is trust involved or they can collapse if trust is not involved. And Sarah's own quotes in her book, and she talks very much about and I think there was a, a quote by somebody here about trusting yourself, your inner guidance, as well as external input. So, and that's certainly a journey I've been on about trusting myself, trusting my instincts as a leader. And so working with that and giving that pro appropriate prominence in how you work, how you operate, how you make decisions. And finally, Brené Brown, Dare to Lead, brilliant book and many other books as well. Um, and she talks about how hard uh, trust is to talk about. So, I'm just going to, and I'll come back to that, by the way. I'm going to talk about three things. I say this is just a very small part of a big landscape. I'm going to talk about power, mindset, and culture. And when I get to culture, I'm going to invite you to, in breakout groups, discuss experiences you've had, the different types of culture, with a very simple model I'll introduce to you later. So, so think about organizations where you are working now or have worked in or teams where there was either high trust or low trust. So have to think about that when you come to breakouts, we'll share. So I want to start, start talking about power um, because this was um, uh, a, a really interesting area. We don't talk about power all that often when we talk about leadership, but the truth is, you know, if you're as I'm at the moment, temporarily leading organization, I find I suddenly acquire power, I acquire authority. You know, when people are, 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 are sort of in, in a team meeting, um, I think they feel the need to listen to me just because of my badge, not because it's me. Um, I feel I can make things happen a little bit more quickly than when I was playing a different role in the organisation. Um, and of course, power is a force for good and a force for other things as well. And it made me think ages ago when I had my very first uh, senior role as a director this is more than three decades ago and I'd taken over as a chief finance officer of a failing business with uh, as a new team gone in to turn it round. I didn't have a huge amount of leadership experience but I knew about finance, knew about money and I thought right I need to take this seriously so I thought I need to set an example so we need to cut costs I'm going to cut the finance team and then when I ask other teams to do the same that's a good example and the other thing I thought is I'm going to be honest and upfront. So I'm not going to mess about. I've only been here a few weeks. I've got five teams. I can only afford four. I'll go and visit the teams that I have to get rid of first up. You know, and that's honest. That's fair, isn't it? So off I drove. I'd only been there a few weeks. Drove down to see them, introduced myself and up front said, look, I'm really sorry. And, you know, I'm polite. You know, I sort of explained why. But I said, I'm really sorry. Um you know, we're going to have to make you redundant as a team. There may be some other jobs in other parts of the country, but actually this is why, and we can't afford this. And all hell broke loose. All hell broke loose. Um, it was uh, not because of the decision, but because of the way I did it. There's a longer version of this story for another time, but suffice to say, um, although the decision was right, and we did follow through on that, and we did actually... Um, uh, make that team redundant and it was difficult and it was challenging as those things always are but I realized I was there for another three years by the way we didn't succeed we didn't turn around the business we had to sell it for a pound three years later and it was a 50 million turnover business tough learning experience for me as a as an early leader um, but the thing that really stuck with me is every time I visited one of my teams during those three years uh, behind my back they were saying here comes the Grim Reaper. And people who know me, I'm so not the Grim Reaper, <laughs> but for those teams, because the first experience of that organization of me going out and having a conversation with them, you're losing your jobs. So every time I turned up, everyone was terrified because they thought oh, it's our turn or it might be our turn. And I never really, really recovered that trust in those teams and the sense of that missed opportunity of being able to do 
It wasn't about the decision, it's about how I related to those colleagues. So that was, it taught me a lesson. And I, I think, you know, now many years later, I really see power as the enemy of trust. Not because power is a bad thing, it's a very useful thing to have, but it's always has a risk. It has a complicated relationship with trust. And if you misuse power, trust can drain away very quickly as I managed to do then. And just in that example, you know, the things that now in my mind when I'm going through difficult decisions like that is, can you really explain why, not just the why, but can you explain why you're making a decision? Do you already have a trustful relationship with the people affected? So it's in the context of somebody who they can appreciate as a human being, not just as somebody making a tough decision. And is it a principled decision? And this is very, very current for me at the minute. The organizations I work with, we're looking at the cost of living crisis, we're looking at colleagues, particularly those on low pay who are really, really suffering with high bills in every sense and real, real life challenges. And as businesses, we're looking at, well, what, what are the pay rises going to be? How do we deal with that? You know, the, this, this inflation vice that we're in is a genuine challenge. And I always come back and all the conversations I've had have come back to a question of principle. What is the right thing to do? What is the most we can possibly afford? And in some cases at the moment, it's, well, we can't afford everything we'd like to pay, but maybe we can pay a bit earlier. So instead of waiting to spread the payments over 12 months, we give people help and relief right now, and then figure out a few months later whether we can provide some more. So those, that's the kind of thing that that principle decision-making drives you to in a, in a very straightforward way. So I want to talk about mindset now, and then uh, we'll come to culture in the breakout in a minute. Um, Brene Brown said in her statement, uh, trust is a tough conversation to have. And I think the reason it's tough is that the, the plain statements, if somebody came along to you and said, I don't trust you, you know, you'd be upset. Um, if somebody came along to you and said, um, I'm not sure you're qualified to go and babysit Chris's children, I go, yeah, no, that's fair enough. It's how you say it, it's being specific. And often I sometimes hear trust weaponized as a, uh, as a verb. You know, I don't feel trusted or I don't trust you. Um, and I think that's why often organizations avoid talking about trust altogether. It's, it's a, a, a difficult subject. And my way of making sense of it is that trust is a mindset, not a goal. And I think if you think about it that way, it helps you incorporate it into your leadership life. It's a bit like Olympic athletes. You know, many years ago, they, they learned the lesson that if your goal is to win a gold medal, that's actually the wrong goal because there's so many variables involved. You don't know what the competition are going to do. You don't know how you're going to be feeling that day. You don't know what the weather conditions are going to be like. If your goal is to train as hard as you possibly can, then what will be will be. It's a similar kind of model. So it'd be great to have the outcome of a gold medal or a trusting environment, but that isn't what you're targeting. You're targeting, in this case, a mindset of trust, or in the Olympics case, a hard training regime. And just something to think about, and um, I won't dwell too much on this, is just think about your mindset. So when you meet a colleague for the first time who have been appropriately recruited, who are there, they might be in another team or in your team, or they might be your superior, whatever that is. What's your mindset? Are you careful? You say, okay, well, you're new here, but my assumption is I don't really trust you to do the things you're going to do, but you can earn that trust and we'll work cautiously together and eventually maybe get to a better place. Or is your mindset of, well, I just assume that I do trust you. I assume you're fine. I'm sure you're completely competent in what you do and you can still lose my trust. You can go the other way by your actions, but I'll make a presumption of generosity. And what I found, I mean, I have a bias towards having a generous mindset. Um, and to be honest, too much. I've sometimes made decisions where I've got in, into working relationships, sometimes legal relationships, which actually have not been productive because I was too trusting. But what I have found is that it's, um, you actually need a bit of both. And it's like, the sense of having a diverse team. This is part of diversity for me. 
that having a careful mindset is actually very powerful. I need colleagues around me who are careful. And I work well with colleagues who are careful because I tend to err on the generous between as we find the right answer. So careful and generous mindsets, I think, are an effective combination. So the big one, culture. This is the, the great challenge of leadership. Can I be effective, but can I help others be effective as well so that the whole organization able to, or the whole team is able to move forward? And I'm proposing to you a very simple model of culture. And there are others, by the way, you know, the, there's Brené Brown has a model for this, which is um, very sophisticated, very impressive. This is a simple model. The first one is what we said about the dictionary definition, a transactional culture. This is about reliability. This is about being professional and doing what you say you're going to do. And that's kind of basic. And we know there are other cultures below that where people really don't do what they say they're going to do. That's not on this list. This is the, 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 the starting point of a trusting culture. So this is good. Then adding on to that, Purposeful cultures, the kind of thing Sarah talks about in her book, Alex talks about in his book, where there are shared goals and most importantly, shared principles as well, where there is a common purpose. And then it's not just about doing what you say you're going to do. It's about going beyond that and doing what it takes and sometimes not doing what you say you're going to do, but doing what it takes to get to the, sh the shared goal, and being transparent about that. And that's a real step up. And we know, and the research is very rich on this, that purposeful teams and organizations are incredibly effective. So this is building on transactional to purposeful. What I'm just starting to explore is a third level, which I call relational, which is where you have generous relationships. In other words, whatever your starting mindset, I'm a bit cautious, you have to prove yourself, is you are always working towards a state of a generous mindset where I deeply trust the people around me to pursue the purpose that we are there to do. That is, I think, and in my experience, the way in which high trust and high performance go together. And it's hard one. The slope gets steeper as you go up. It's easily lost. It moves around. You will have transactional days. You will have non-transactional days where somebody has just forgotten to do what they said they were going to do. You will have purposeful days where it all comes together. Underpinning that, if you have those strong, generous relationships that you have built towards and it takes time, then it makes it much easier to go to the top of that slope. So transactional, purposeful and relational. So I'd like to call in breakout groups now. And I'd like you to um, just answer one question, which is, again, you may wanna make a note of this. I don't think the slides translate to the breakouts, but if you think about transactional being reliable, purposeful having shared goals and principles and relational having generous relationships, have you experienced cultures at any of those levels? And just think of one example, which may be interesting to colleagues and share that in your breakout. And I suggest we take 10 minutes for that um, and then we'll call you back in and ask for feedback from your group so okay. chris can you can you yeah. load so that up please op open the rooms uh we're going to be in groups of three and four so i'm going to open them now you'll get a message pop up um so uh, and we'll see you back here in in just over 10 minutes welcome right. back welcome back everybody how are the conversations? We're going to hand straight back to Pablo, and I think Pablo, you're going to uh, take us take us from here. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm just trying to get my view uh, so I can see more people. That's better. Um, so I just want to invite. Um, oh, hello, lots of people I know. Hello, everyone. Um, <laughs> uh, I just want to invite you to um, to share a bit of feedback from that discussion, um, and and then I'm just going to do a very very short wrap up, so we really have a chance to to hear hopefully from everyone. So, if anybody remembers which room they were in, room one, who'd like to give us a, a feel for that conversation? Tell you who the 
room one is. So room one, I think, was Emily, Jan. Uh, I think it's Emily and Jan in room one. Yes, hello. Hi, Jan. You know, we, we talked very much about the, well, we, we just, I suppose we spent our time reflecting, I think, more than talking. We reflect on our own experiences, particularly the, the, the one which was interesting, was I think, the, the relational one. When do you experience generosity? And how it is, seems to be context related. Um, yeah, kind of personal generosity, and it can also be you know, the environment. <clears throat> it's risky. The risk involved it can be high. Yes, yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah. But you have experienced that. Yes, the, in a minor way. Yes, yes. I mean, particularly, we have a political. We, I worked in the West Bank for a while with a colleague, and you know, when you're working with new with, with new people, you just don't know which side of the let's say political story other people right. are. Right, right. And that could cause awful uh, friction. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Do do you? Should we, let's move to room two. Um, who'd like to feedback from that conversation? That was Adam, Joe, and V Heaven. Um, I don't mind feeding back if Joe or, or, or Veronica oh, um, don't mind. Go ahead, Adam. Please go ahead. Um, so yes, yeah, so we had a interesting discussion and we're trying to figure out you know if what levels and, and we worked at in different organizations and there was a feeling of I think the first couple of levels is, is more common in terms of uh, the transactional and, and purposeful and um, but Veronica talked about being talking about a, a more generous culture which was uh, which has been able to be established for a long period of time like more of a family culture that the company had been around for a long time over like several decades or over 100 years and I found that very interesting myself in terms of how, how that can be maintained over a period of time and, and, and I talked about how I've worked in different companies like one company started off being trusting um, in a startup where things are going really well and then the, the economic situation changes and then there's layoffs and then there's a the feeling of, of less trust you know uh, on the other side so it, it I think for me, it's, it was about my takeaway was a trusting an organization or a generous one is one that when things are going badly, you can also still you still hold that level of trust and generosity, um, and and you don't you know go the other way. And usually, a red flag is actually saying that we're a family. So if if a if a company can get away with doing that authentically and say you know you know we, we treat you like a family, then that's great. I think a lot of companies use that as a Catchphrase to see, yeah, we're a family, but families don't usually let you know fire fire their members or, or that kind of thing, you know. So it's so it's I think this this that use of language is, is interesting as well. Um, and also we talked about about how you build trust. Like sometimes it's difficult to get it at the beginning, but over time you can actually build trust. That's what, that's what Joe was talking about in particular. And so it's, you're sometimes very lucky if you can get into an organization that's already generous. Um, and um, and and I think not so many people have had. That. I didn't feel I, I haven't had that experience myself. I would love to find a company that was at that level of of trust. Thank you. Hopefully, I covered most of the points there. Tell me if I missed anything. Yeah. Um, thank you, Adam. Yeah. So you're getting the thumbs up there. So that's um, it's really interesting that that being tested by circumstances. You know, because when times are good, it's kind of you know the the culture doesn't doesn't get stress tested when when they're more challenging when you have to make tough decisions that's when you know whether you've really got that that high level of of trust and that family culture question because of course people got different experiences of what family culture really is so i think that's, that's probably quite, quite a brave place to go to to say oh we're a family because you know you will have as, as many different experiences as you have people of what that really means um mm -hmm. And, and of course, the point about building trust because it is a it's a process. You're 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 always building. You're always moving it somewhere. Thank you so much. So, room three. Who wants to um, uh, reflect Amanda, on the conversation? Jenny and Stuart. Uh, Amanda or Jenny, or do you want to go? I'm happy to. Well, I, I spilled the beans on Pablo, obviously, because uh, we... Oh, Amanda, you closely. didn't. No. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> um, 
Uh, I don't mind starting, Stuart, uh, Jenny, if you want to, to chip in. Um, Stuart and I had something in common in that we'd, we'd had you know, deep trust within you know, a relatively small team, but also then been part of uh, an executive team that didn't have that at all, where trust was tr transaction at, at best, actually. Um, and the fact that it's exhausting, um, going from deep trust and then almost code switching to, to not having that. Um, I mean, that was one point that came out of that. Stuart, Jenny, do you want to add more? Yeah, I thought that was a really interesting one in terms of thinking about the role trust plays in terms of organizational capacity and the value or you know, payoff of having a high trust culture is it frees up that energy that is otherwise going into frustration and uh, putting on your armor and self-protecting and limiting yourself and battening down the hatches to try and get through the transactional combat. But when you're part of a relational culture and you have the purpose in relation, it's like all the energy is aligned and free flowing. And it's just such a no brainer in terms of creating a healthy organization that really can live up to its potential. And I've never met a CEO who felt like, I really feel like we are hitting our true potential. They recognize the gap between what could be and what is, but they're often, often struggling in the transactional realm to try and solve it. Um, leaving aside the purpose and relational realms and dominion, domains that are the ones that really can loosen up and, and, and liberate that, that true potential and energy. So it was really helpful to just articulate, Amanda, that energy cost that we feel when we're not in a trusting relationship. That's really interesting because, of course, the, the emotional cost doesn't go into the finance director's cost benefit analysis, does it? <laughs> it's um it's in because some of this is do with you know the the language of the boardroom do we have a way of talking about this mm -hmm. um because we're much more comfortable in the hard landscaping of you know impact cost benefit kpi and often sometimes sometimes not but often less less comfortable in the the, the human language mm -hmm. thank you so shall we um, hear from room four, who would like to be back? Room four was Ashley, Mark, and Gruchla and Rawia. What do you think, Rawia? Can, can my flu opt me out? Would, would you like to do it? Yeah, thank you. I meant you can go ahead, Mark, if you want. You want me to do it? <clears throat> if you like. Uh, I thought it was really interesting what Adam said about um, how um, trust levels can change when the chips are down or when things get a little bit more tricky and relationships might become more strained. Um, stakes may be higher, maybe more insecurities. Perhaps those are the tests of character and tests of relationships, tests of trust that mm -hmm. really do help you to understand who's who. Um, in, in our conversation, there, was, there were two coach, uh, coaches. So there's that very sort of a recognition that um, the generosity of trust was required from clients. Um, and obviously, then that's something that can, they can work with, but otherwise can perhaps make that job coaching difficult. Um, and also we, we observed that, you know, there might be differences in much larger organizations. So in your big, big companies to, to smaller teams, perhaps, as to how the relational aspect works and, and what people's, um, I suppose, boundaries are and expectations from, from colleagues might be as to what, what trust means in those kind of situations, whether it's a small company or, or a very, very large organization. Thank you. Yeah, because it, it's in a large organization, it's it's harder to maintain that that level of connection. It's um it's it, you know it's another level of leadership challenge, isn't it? To to maintain a relational culture when you're spread out over the world over many many um, teams and many territories. So Thank you. Of, I think we're down to to three minutes. Left. Okay, so it's very little time. So very quick feedback. Group group six. Wait a minute, what about group five? 
I beg your pardon, group five. The reason is because I want to tell you guys about Nick, because I think yeah. the, the story of um, Nick starting something new and the idea about trust when there's change and all of us sort of knowing in the emerging reality that the future of work is going to be this hybrid hybrid version of work, going to the office all the time is probably not going to be a part of many people's lives. So I think that when I listen to Nick's story, it's very much about purpose and relationships because like he said, he's working with people he trusts, started a, new business, started a new company with people he trusts and now he has the freedom to work from anywhere. That's the dream, that's living the dream. Now, once you start booking the, you know, the profits and so on, it's even better, but the real, I, the trusting in yourself and then selecting people to work with who you trust and then going on an adventure of trying to build something new. So I just wanted to shout that out, Nick. That was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, Fabulous. That's, that's, that's very generous of you and put far better than I could. Um, and I think we were also talking about trust through reinvention. Um, and, and your career, Deborah, going and moving through from um, clothing design through studying um, international relations and uh, and now your work in, in uh, peace building. Um, it sounded sounded fabulous. And the kind of trust that you need to have in, in yourself as you move through those different um, sectors as well as some of the, the parallels and common threads of, of confidence that you have in, in yourself and your abilities. Um, it's a desperately, desperately important, very inspiring. So thank you for sharing your story. Yeah, thank you. And that trust in yourself is is critical and all power to you, Nick. So look, I'm sorry, I've the, we're running about a time. Chris, we can either, because um, I think you'll want to round up, I suspect. Shall, so shall we invite six, seven and eight to share their thoughts? Um, uh, by another means. Do you have a way of doing that, Chris? Yeah, we could do, we could capture it in the chat if people want to put that in. If you, yeah, so apologies, six, seven, eight. Um, I used to be a mathematician, obviously not anymore. So um, please, please pop in the chat any any further thoughts. And um, Chris, over to you to round up. And I just left you there a slide of the of the key takeaways, but also, you know, wonderful points made here about, well, uh, a whole host of, of other things of fabulous insights. Thank you. Cool. And we will share. Is that okay, Pablo? We share the slides with everybody. Yeah. Perfect. So what we always do at this stage is we take a screenshot. Um, and so uh, normally Alberto does this, but as he's in the airport, I'm going to try and do it. So if everybody could uh, show us how you feel having had this discussion about trust uh, with the Purpose Collective. So we're going to do one, two, three. Okay, I'm going to do one more. One, two, three. Perfect. Okay, so I think that is us for time. Um, the Purpose Collective is now going to have the summer off, so no conversations about purpose uh, until September. Um, so we're going to have a little bit of a break. Thank you to Pablo for a really thought-provoking session. Thank you to everybody for joining us today, Alberto in the airport and Sarah. And uh, yeah, I hope everybody has an excellent rest of the day and hopefully we'll see you again in September.